paradigm shift. An educational comedy. It's not a cause. Not a movement. It's not a social group you can slap a label on to. It's, it's an, an idea. idea. It's an intention. It's an intuition. A mindset in which reality can be explored. It's a genuine expression. A sermon. Critical thinking and imagination. To look inward upon ourselves. To better understand the external world around us. And yes, two egos are bound to be bruised. With our silly, strange, politically incorrect. Your style of going about things. Real, Real and raw honesty. Which invites you to be to the, the fullest. fullest. Christianity today in the developed world is in a statistical free fall. These people go to church sometimes. They hear the Bible read, and the Bible makes no sense to them. The Bible expresses a world that no longer exists. And yet these stories are read in church after church after church, and people end the reading by saying, this is the word of the Lord. That doesn't give you much opportunity to challenge and to suggest that maybe there's another way to look at these stories. We are finally producing a generation of people, we call them the millennials, who are no longer willing to put up with this. They're walking away from organized religion in droves. So we are in a world where either you give up your religion in order to live in the secular society, or you give up the secular society in order to maintain the ghetto of your religious life. That's the world you and I face. That's the world we live in. And that's the world in which the church will either live or die. How can you be a person of faith in such a world? So we come to this church. We come to this conference because we hope there's another alternative. We hope there's a way to hold these two things together. It will not be without pain. It will not be without controversy or tension. But I think it can be done. I want to take just one aspect of our religious understanding, just one aspect, and try to examine it in detail. I do that because of the pressure of time. I do that because this aspect might open in your minds in all sorts of different directions. It's an aspect of the Christian story that is central to everything we say we believe. Because I want to talk about how we have defined Jesus of Nazareth. So hang on to your seats. And let's begin. In order to make the way we think traditionally about the figure of Jesus makes very little sense unless you accept the ancient definition of what it means to be human. Have you ever noticed that we define or call Jesus by certain titles? We call Jesus Savior. And when we define Jesus as savior, we're also defining ourselves as sinful. Because the only purpose of a savior is to save that which is sinful. So to call Jesus savior means you're also defining yourself rather negatively. To call Jesus rescuer means that you're defining yourself as someone who needs to be rescued, someone who's lost. To define Jesus as Redeemer means that you're defining yourself something like an object in a pawn shop 
Somebody's got to come and give it value again, redeem it. Now, what do these titles that we have given Jesus say about how we understand human life? And is that accurate? Is it even biblical? Where did the idea come from that human beings are born in sin? Where did the idea come from that human beings are fallen creatures? And are those ideas accurate? Well, let me suggest to you that they're not biblical concepts. They are fourth century interpretations of the opening chapter of the book of Genesis by a group of Gentile Christians who had no earthly understanding how Jews wrote sacred scripture. Let me explain that for just a moment. The fourth century treated the Bible as if it was the lit literal word of God. That is, God had dictated it. God had written it. God had dictated it. And they assumed that the Bible had dropped from heaven, fully written, divided into chapters and verses, just in the form that they had received it, and in its original Greek language. They did not embrace the fact that the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew, that it was written without any spaces between words, that it was written without any punctuation or capital letters, and that it was written from chapter 1 of Genesis all the way through to the final chapter of Revelation. That was their assumption. And they put that interpretation into the Bible itself. So they believe God wrote first chapter 1 of Genesis. And second, God wrote chapter 2 of Genesis. They were not aware, as biblical scholars are today, that chapter 2 of Genesis is actually 500 years older than chapter 1. They didn't know about that. They saw it as one continuous story, and they literalized it, and they interpreted humanity against the background of those texts, and then they forced the Jesus story into the answer to the problem that human life possessed. And our humanity has somehow been corrupted, broken, fallen, sinful. We use all the kinds of words. And it was something that we could not by ourselves overcome. God's perfection had been ruined, and it was so desperately evil that we passed it on from generation to generation so that every child is born in sin. What a strange idea. I baptized a child a couple of weeks ago in a little chapel off the coast of Maine. The child was 11 weeks old, beautiful little baby named Chapman. But in that baptism service, we prayed that Chapman would be cleansed from sin. I kept wondering what he had done. <laughs> to my knowledge, he hadn't robbed a bank or committed adultery or told a lie or expressed prejudice. And someone did say that babies were born with a loudspeaker on one end and no sense of responsibility on the other. <laughs> but that's not culpable, that's not sinful, that's natural. Now, I grant you that babies are sometimes inconvenient, they're not always sensitive to your needs. But to call a newborn baby born in sin? Well, it's a strange idea. The service of baptism was developed in the church so that we could wash the stain of Adam's sin off every newborn baby. And we actually said, if you do not baptize this child, your child will never be in the presence of God through all eternity. What kind of God is that? A God who is so evil that this God will punish little babies because their parents didn't get them to the church on time. What a strange idea. Now we start out with talking about little babies that way. But look what we do to ordinary adults on every Sunday morning. The church is a guilt trip. 
We bring people into church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday to tell them what wretched, miserable sinners they are. I keep wondering why they keep coming. I don't know about your liturgy, but in my liturgy, in my church, you can't come without calling yourself, quote, a miserable offender. How in the world do Episcopalians deal with that? Well, they're so upper crusty, they don't really believe it. They just say it. Might be true of those other people, but it's certainly not true of us. Then we say of ourselves, there is no health in us. No wholeness. Then we say, we are not worthy even to gather up the crumbs under the divine table. We're constantly insulting people's humanity. Sometimes I wonder how they have the strength and courage to get up after Sunday worship and walk out with any dignity. Guilt has become the primary message of the Christian church. Guilt, the gift that keeps on giving. And we also portray God as rather vengeful. In my church, and I suspect in yours, or at least in your experience, we constantly taught that we are to approach God on our knees. It's a rather strange posture. That might be an appropriate posture for a slave to approach a master, for a serf to approach the lord of the manor, for a beggar to approach the source of his or her next meal, but is that ever the posture for a child of God to approach the source of his or her life? And we're taught to pray to this God for mercy. If Episcopalians say anything to God in worship on a Sunday morning is, Lord, have mercy on me. We say it over and over again. Sometimes we get so tired of saying it that we translate it into Greek and we say Kyrie eleison instead of Lord have mercy. But Kyrie eleison simply means Lord have mercy. We have threefold Kyries, we have ninefold Kyries. Sometimes in our prayers we say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. What kind of God do we worship that we approach on our knees begging for mercy? I think there are appropriate times to beg for mercy. I think a trembling child standing before an abusive parent might well say, have mercy on me. I think a convicted felon standing before a hanging judge might well say, have mercy on me. But is have mercy on me ever appropriate as the prayer for a child of God to the source of life and love and being? So we permeate our worship with images of our sinfulness. We do it to little babies. We do it to big adults. The primary message of the church is that you are a fallen sinner. You have been infected with something called original sin. It's universal. It's inescapable. Because we had that definition of human life, we told the Jesus story in terms of that definition. So what's the purpose of Jesus? Jesus is God's rescue operation, designed to rescue the fallen creation, to overcome the sin of the world. And then the story gets even stranger. How did Jesus go about accomplishing this salvation? If that was his purpose, how did he accomplish it? The answer is, he accomplished it by dying for our sins. Have you ever thought about what that means? Who required the death of Jesus? The answer is, God did. What kind of God is this? The Divine Father requires the death of the Divine Son because you and I are sinful? What a strange idea. Does that not, that not make God the original child abuser? 
And yet this stuff permeates our life. We can't even sing about how amazing God's grace is without reminding ourselves that God's grace is amazing because it can save a wretch like you or me. We're wretches. What kind of worship is this? And if Jesus died for our sins, why did God require that? Why didn't God forgive? That seems like a divine option. Why didn't God say, well, you've really made a mess of it, but I still love you and I forgive you. That's what most parents would do to their wayward children. But that's not the way we portray God. We portray God as some kind of Eastern potentate who requires a blood offering and a human sacrifice before this God can be moved to forgive. What a strange idea. Yet it's all over our tradition. It's all over our worship. God had to have a victim. Jesus is the victim. Our sins caused God to kill Jesus. Is there any gospel in such a message? Let me look for just a moment at what that particular formulation of our faith, which is so familiar to all of us. Let's look at what it does first to God. It turns God into a monster, a demon, a being who cannot forgive, a being who has to be placated with a blood offering. Why would anybody want to worship such a God? And what does it do to Jesus? It turns him into a chronic perpetual victim. That's why we never let him off his cross. He's always portrayed being crucified. Maybe he likes suffering. Maybe Jesus is a masochist who just can't wait to mount his cross to suffer some more. So God becomes a monster, Jesus becomes a masochist. And what happens to you and me in this theology, in this religion? We become guilt-filled zombies. And we go around saying such incredible things as Jesus died for my sins. Think about what that means. That means you and I, because of our sinfulness, have become Christ killers. We define human life as evil. We define God as righteous. We define Jesus as God's rescue operation. And in the process, this theology, which is called the theology of atonement, this theology makes God a monster, Jesus a masochist, and it makes you and me guilt-filled creatures. No wonder people are leaving the church. If that's what Christianity is, who needs it? It's not just the trappings of the miraculous and pre-modern thinking. It's a theology that denigrates our humanity. Christians throughout our history have been deeply prejudiced people. But we have a theology of victimization. And if you have a theology of victimization, you almost inevitably create victimizers. So we hated the Jews. During the Crusades, we hated the Muslims. During the 14th century, we hated the heretics. Later, we hated people of color, so we enslaved them. Then we hated women, so we diminished them. Then we hated homosexuals, and so we persecuted them. A victimizing theology always creates victimizers. How far that is from John's Gospel's portrayal of Jesus' purpose, that we might have life and have it abundant. So we have this original perfection corrupted by original sin, the need to be rescued, the divine rescue operation, the restoration to our original perfection. 
And that's the way we've told the Christ story. Now what's wrong with it? Everything. What's wrong with it is that if that is who or what God is, we do not need God in our lives. If Jesus' purpose was to die for your sins, it is a highly neurotic religion. If the best we can do is to fill you with guilt because we can manipulate you better if you feel guilty, then we are participating in something that violates everything we know about God. But perhaps the most important thing that's wrong with it is that it is simply not so. Folks, there's nothing about us that was fallen. Everything about us is emerging. I am not looking out this evening on a group of fallen sinners. I'm looking out on a group of incomplete people. You don't need to be rescued from a fall that never happened. You don't, be need, you don't need to be saved from a sin that never occurred. You don't need to be restored to a status you've never possessed. You need, be, you need to be loved and empowered into being all that you are capable of being. You need to find a new humanity where you do not have to build yourself up in your own insecurity by tearing someone else down. You have to reach the place where your own survival is not the driving value of your life. Humanity is born when you begin to love somebody else more than you love yourself. And that's what the Jesus story is all about. It's not about a sacrifice, not about Jesus being put to death by God to pay the price that God required for the sins of your life and my life. It's about a human being who achieves such depths of humanity that he can transcend the biological drive to survive and give his life and his love away. That's why they said God was in Christ. They saw in this Jesus something that human life could not have produced. That's why they wrote virgin birth stories. That's why they said death cannot contain him. There was something about the power of this Jesus that was so God-fused, infused, and God-given that it escaped every boundary, even the boundary of finitude. And if you want to look at the Jesus story, you do not see someone sent by God to pay the price for your sins. You see someone who is able to put his own needs aside and care about others beyond his boundaries. Read the story of Jesus. How else better could he have lived out his message that there is nothing you or I can ever do and nothing you or I can ever be that will finally separate us from the love of God. That's what the Jesus message is about. It's about love. It's about enhancing humanity. That's why the fourth gospels Jesus can say, I've come that they might have life and that they might have it abundantly. Nobody ever gets life by being told how bad they are. Have you ever known anybody to be improved by your constant attention to all of their weaknesses, shortcomings, and sinfulness? That's not the way life works. It just doesn't do it that way. The message of the Christ is that God loves you as you are, and God calls you beyond your boundaries to be all that you can be. And when the Christian church finally embraces that distinction and begins to live that message, then a hurting world will be drawn once more into the life of this community. And worship will once more begin to make sense because worship is a call to life. To me, God is not a noun that must be defined. 
God is a verb that must be lived. There's a great difference. I believe I experience God as the source of life. And if God is the source of life, then the only way I can worship God is by living, by living fully. Secondly, I define God as the source of love. And if God is a source of love, the only way I can worship God is by loving. And thirdly, I believe I experience God, in Paul Tillich's words, as the ground of all being. And if God is the ground of all being, then the only way I can worship God is by having the courage to be everything that I am capable of being and trying to build a world where everyone else has the capacity to become all that they were meant to be not with my definition being imposed upon them, but with their humanity expanding to its limits. So God is the source of life, the source of love, the ground of being, calling me to live and to love and to be. And to that I add one thing more. I'm a Christian. I claim that name. I do not want Benedict the 16th or Jerry Falwell or anybody else defining a Christian in such a way that I'm not part of that community. So I claim the title. And I claim the title because when I look at the life of Jesus of Nazareth, I find one who lived fully, who loved, who dared to be all that he was created to be, and in the process made God visible in our world in a dramatically different way. That's what the Christian faith is all about. And if we could ever turn this faith toward this new human expansive possibility, then I believe the Christian faith has a chance to live again. It will not look like the church of today, but it will be true to the meaning of the God that we believe we have experienced in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. In my mind, this is what that thing we call progressive Christianity is all about. And I believe it offers the only hope for a Christian future.